Good evening, good evening, good evening, Apostle Gemma. Good evening uh, to our distinguished panelists. I am Minister Danley White. Welcome, welcome to Destiny Training Institute's virtual panel discussion on violence against women, highlighting solutions. This evening, we have a very power packed panel of uh, presenters who will bring to you some of the pertinent uh, information in the atmosphere today. As you all know, we have uh, sat by and looked at the scourge of uh, violence against our women folk, especially in Trinidad and Tobago and around the world. And we at the Destiny Training Institute, Divine Destiny, we are not going to sit idly by. So this is uh, one of the steps that we have chosen to take in uh, ensuring that we have solutions that are presented primarily this evening for kingdom citizens. We're going to start uh, this evening's uh, presentation with some introductions. First of all, I'm going to introduce my co-host, who is Elder Francine Britton. Uh, she will be working together with me this evening to do the introductions of all our speakers. Um, and then we will go through a quick show of the agenda and what we're going to be tackling this evening. So over to my co-host, Francine Britton. Good evening, one and all. And as my co-host said, welcome. I will start the profile of Apostle Gemma Duncan. Apostle Gemma Duncan, accomplished author, sorry, radio and talk show host, and was a preacher and teacher. She's married to Apostle Emmanuel Vivian Duncan, and with three champions of Springs, Donnell, who is married to Angel, and together they now pastor the body church in Atlanta, USA. Dion, who is, a man, who is married to Leah, and together they, they have two sons, Darian and Daniel. Dr. J. Patrice, who is an up and coming successful dental surgeon in the USA, a works together with her husband in providing pastoral leadership for divine. Destiny Worship Center. However, an Apostle Vivian, Apostle Gemma has been called to the nation to provide apostolic travels extensively, boldly delivering what God has deposited with a nerve to impact. Thank you very much, Francine. Our next um, presenter is Dr. Angel Duncan. Dr. Angel Duncan is a university professor, entrepreneur, trainer, author, and mentor. Professionally, she has held leadership posts in the corporate, academic, and nonprofit sectors. She's an ordained pastor at the Body Church alongside her husband, Pastor Donnell. Currently, Dr. Donnell, Dr. Duncan serves as a business instructor at two prominent Christian universities. She spent several years of her life developing restorative programs and working to free women and children who were enslaved in human trafficking. She also conducts transformative workshops for nonprofit organizations, serving women recovering from substance abuse, domestic violence, or commercial sexual exploitation. Dr. Duncan is a co-founder of the Hepsiba mentorship program which provides a safe space for unmarried women to engage in courageous conversations and embrace their god-given purpose she holds a bachelor's degree in business administration a master's in business management and a phd in human services with a specialty in nonprofit agency development let us welcome dr angel duncan next we have Dr. Joanne Spence. Dr. Joanne Spence is the Chief Consultant 
the Therapeutic Assessment Center. Dr. Spence is a behavior change consultant, educator, research fellow, chief consultant, and at the Therapeutic Assessment Center. She is the head of a social work department, the CNC, which is the Caribbean Nazarene College, a lecturer and course developer at the University of the West Indies, and the proud author of six books. The boards and committees that she serve on, the YTEP board, she's the director at present, the SEA and Concordat committee member at present, member of the Oxford Society of Scholars at present, member of the multi-sectoral committee to address the impact of deported persons to Trinidad and Tobago from 2015. She's also the member of the National Mentorship Program Committee from 2011. The organizations to which she's a member, she's a member of the Association of Caribbean Criminal Justice Practitioners, Trinidad and Tobago chapter president. She's still dope. That's a education PhD in social research with emphasis on criminal justice. Oxford Graduate School, Masters in Mediation, and UE, the Bachelors of Science in Social Work. She's a certified member of British Psychological Society to conduct psychological services. And she's been awarded in 2013, and she received the International Women's Day Award for Work in Youth Development from Ministry of Labor and Microenterprises. Let us welcome Dr. Joanne Spence. Next, we have Ms. Aisha Kobe. Ms. Aisha Kobe is a clinical psychologist with over 10 years experience delivering therapeutic services to adult and child survivors of crime trauma. She has also facilitated numerous training workshops on crisis, trauma, and family violence. Ms. Kobe is the director of the Victim and Witness Support Unit of the TTPS. She holds a Master of Science degree in clinical psychology, postgraduate credentials in mediation, along with a Bachelor of Science in psychology and management. She's a certified mediator with the Mediation Board of Trinidad and Tobago and a human trafficking facilitator. Currently, she is the manager of the Victim and Witness Support Unit of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service and has served that unit from its formation over the past 12 years. Her contribution over the years provided strategic direction, which led to effective institutional strengthening and service delivery to various victim populations across Trinidad and Tobago. Mrs. Corby's passion is toward the creation of a society where the vulnerable and persons in at-risk situations are respected and empowered with tools to lead productive life. Let us welcome Ms. Aisha Corby. Next, we have Ms. Alana Wheeler. Ms. Alana Wheeler is the director of the Counter Trafficking Unit, Ministry of National Security. Ms. Wheeler is a graduate of Bishops and Steel Girls High School, Port of Spain, the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine Management Studies Program and Institute of International Relations. She's a foreign Fulbright Scholar and pursued a Master of Arts degree in National Security Studies at Gagetown University School of Foreign Service, Washington, DC. Ms. Wheeler has worked in the field of national security for over 20 years, eight of which have been in anti-human trafficking efforts in Trinidad and Tobago. She's conducted sensitization and training sessions for judges, law enforcement officers, magistrates, labor inspectors, airport frontline staff and officers, and senior public officers in, the Trinidad, in Trinidad and Tobago. She has implemented local anti-corruption initiatives with civil society organizations under the umbrella of Transparency International. The CTU, which she directs, has sensitized over 3,000 persons in, <coughs> excuse me, in community and faith-based organizations, over 1,000 parents and teachers, and over 13,000 Trinidad and Tobago primary and secondary school children on the signs and indications of human trafficking. Let us welcome Ms. Alana Wheeler. 
Next, we have Senior Superintendent Retired, Mr. Patrick McMillan. Mr. McMillan is a retired police officer who last served at the police special branch at the rank of Senior Superintendent. He had the distinguished responsibility of providing security for heads of state in Trinidad and Tobago and visiting heads of state to Trinidad and Tobago. He is the holder of several certifications in security management, security planning, protective security, threat assessment, and training of officers in the skill sets of protective security. Patrick's greatest security achievement was the training of over 700 officers as bodyguards for the world leader, the world leader summit of the Americas in 2009 and the Commonwealth Heads of Nations Conference 2009, which conference that was safely held in Trinidad and Tobago. He also worked with several prime ministers and presidents of Trinidad and Tobago at home and when they traveled abroad. He also personally provided bodyguard duties to U.S. Presidents Clinton, Obama, and Joe Biden on their visits to this country. Patrick credits his relationship with Almighty God for keeping him safe through the years of given duties. He is married with one son, whom he cherishes and supports as a national competitive swimmer. Currently, he has been recalled into the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service and is serving as a police superintendent. Shall we please... Welcome, Mr. Patrick McMillan. Finally, we have Mr. Anthony Walcott. Mr. Anthony Walcott is a small arms and unarmed combat instructor. He is a faithful covenant of Divine Destiny Worship Center, Dego Martin, and our last expert presenter on today's panel. Some of Mr. Walcott's accolades include he's an active member of the Protective Services or was for the past 41 years. He's a small arms and unarmed combat instructor, hostage rescue and high-risk arrest operator with the elite Trinidad and Tobago Police Service MOPS, hostage negotiation, anti-terrorist trainer, sports massage therapist, therapist with many national teams. He is a motivational speaker, a part-time lecturer at the Cipriani Labor College, father, husband, and friend to many. Shall we please welcome Mr. Anthony Walcott. Thank you very much. At this time, we want to ask um, my co-host, Elder Francine, to introduce uh, the first um, event on today's agenda, which will be a spoken word uh, showing by one of our young uh, Davis Company members. Sister Francine? Yes, I trust that you're hearing me a little better now. So we want to introduce a spoken word by Miss Kyla Wilson entitled Is Today the Day? Walking down the street with one fear on my mind. Is today the day? Is today the day that I never see my family again? Is today the day my life comes to an end? Is today the day my life loses its meaning? Is today the day I'm only used for a man's pleasure? What happened to my sweet, sweet TNT? Where did love from a country? Why they had to go? Ashanti, Andrea, and so many more. Why should we suffer at the hands of man? Aren't you supposed to be our protectors? When will all these issues be brought out from under the rug? Where do our ladies go? When will men learn no means no, or address is not a yes? I want to walk and not have to hold my purse tight and fear for my life. 
My Google history should not say how to make homemade pepper spray. I want to feel the same sense of freedom as a man. I want to walk the streets at night, and I want to wear whatever I like. Not only my knife at the back of my mind, but my afterlife. Is today the day? Is today the day my family never sees me again? Together for, for Kyla Wilson. That was very well done. Our young people are making themselves heard, and that's what we need. So moving along, thank you very much, Kyla. We're going to have, first of all, our opening overview and prayer, then presentation by Apostle Gemma Duncan. Thank you very much. Awesome. We pray for every presenter. We pray for every participant that we are going to have positive feedback and responses from what is done today. In the name of Jesus, amen. On behalf of Apostle Vivian Duncan and myself, I want to welcome and thank every uh, participation, pa every facilitator, and uh, every single person who is logged on. I want to lay the foundation for this workshop by saying that a person's present circumstance does not determine their future. Uh, it doesn't determine your final destination because I want to give hope for all the women who are logged on today and who will probably see this sometime in the future, that your present situation may be a little dark, but we want to give you hope that change can come. It doesn't have to be like this. Uh, the Bible is replete with examples of women whose lives were radically transformed and whose fortunes were changed for the better. And I want to just use one example in the book of Ruth, who is the main character of the book. And uh, Ruth came from a background of misfortune, incest, widowhood, poverty, and grave loss. But today, if you ever read the Bible, Ruth's name will be forever remembered as one of the four parents of uh, Jesus. So many times out of our difficulty out of our challenges could come greatness. Many people wrote uh, their story and their books are now bestsellers. It brought them uh, income. It brought them fame. I mean, you would wish you didn't have the experience. Uh, and it really changed the lives of others as they read their books. Uh, so I want to leave you with the few thoughts that every woman is a good idea. When you get a chance, read Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. And God told Jeremiah, even before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. So you are a good idea and you have the right to be here. Uh, you were never intended for abuse. It's not God's will. It doesn't matter what you do, what you know, your background is. God never intended you for abuse. Uh, write down the scripture again, Jeremiah 20, 29, 11, where God says, I... My wish for you is to, have, to be good, only good. Uh, and I want you to know that God loves you unconditionally. John 3.16 talks about God loving everybody. And so that's where we want to start off. And remember, regardless of what you've done, God forgives you. Because I know that many women in abusive situations tend to self-blame. God is forgiving. Even if you... There was some complicity. You had a little part to play in what ultimately happened. Uh, God forgives. Move on. Remember your present situation is not your final destination. Let me turn you back to uh, the host right now. Thank you very much, Apostle Gemma, for that very uh, appropriate introduction and overview to this workshop. Moving right along, we have next 
um, in our batting order, Dr. Angel Duncan, who will handle for us early red flags of abuse and abusers, physical telltale signs of domestic violence, pornography and its impact on domestic violence, and personally preparing for a safe and productive existence as women and girls. Dr. Angel Duncan. Well, good night. My name is Dr. Angel Duncan, and I want to thank um, Apostles Vivian and Gemma Duncan for this opportunity. I also want to give greetings to my colleagues here on this panel and all those who are viewing us online right now. My condolences to the friends and families of Angela Barrett and Ashante Riley and the entire nation of Trinidad and Tobago for the tragic loss of these women and for so many others. I am honored to be a voice on this panel sharing briefly about red flags to recognize surrounding domestic violence, physical telltale signs of domestic violence, pornography and its impact on violence against women, then some suggestions to prepare women and girls for safe and productive existences. According to the Partnership Against Domestic Violence or the PADV, domestic abuse is a pattern of hurtful behavior used by one partner to systematically control and overpower the other. It is also known as intimate partner violence. Abuse can be spiritual, physical, emotional, psychological, economical, cultural, verbal, and sexual. The PADV also identifies 13 early red flags or warning signs for domestic abuse. I'll mention five of them. Does the person that you're with make you feel afraid? Do they tell you that you will never be anything without them? Do they treat you roughly? Do they push you, shove you, grab you, hit you, or spit on you? Do they constantly call or show up unannounced to check and verify your location? Do they try to control your actions and your relationships of who to see, when to see them, and when and where you can go to see them? According to the World Health Organization, physical telltale signs of domestic violence may include physical injuries such as black eyes, bruised arms, bruised neck, sprained wrist, bruised or busted lips, and broken bones. What causes a person to be an abuser anyway? Well, there's several contributors and I'll mention five of them. Your abuser may be someone who has a, a low self-esteem, low self-worth. They may lack self-control. They may have experienced previous victimization themselves. They may also have a drug or alcohol addiction, which we know is a spirit. They also may have a pornography addiction, which is also a spirit. The COVID-19 pandemic lockdown has increased global use of technology for effective employment, education, entertainment, and church community engagement. So technology has been beneficial even right now. Tragically though, it has increased the global exposure and consumption of pornography. Pornography is a key indicator or contributor and also the fuel for violent acts against women and children, including commercial sexual exploitation, child sex trafficking, and yes, domestic violence. Porn has become mainstream entertainment in our society and it is an estimated $97 billion global industry. And that number is continually increasing and changing. In the US alone, it's a $15 billion uh, economy. What are some of the sources of this pornography? Movies, TV, video games, social media, platforms that we use, strip clubs, and of course, pornographic websites. If this is something that's happening to you, I implore you to reach out, tell someone that you trust, tell a friend, tell a neighbor, tell a parent, tell a mentor, tell a teacher, tell law enforcement, tell someone so you can get help. Porn is a favorite pastime for millions of consumers or customers, and they have no idea of the harm that they are doing to their lives, to the lives of their marriages, their families, and also all kinds of exploitation that's happening against women and girls. They have no clue of the damage that's happening on the other side. According to the National Center for Sexual Exploitation, pornography impacts domestic violence in three ways. Number one, pornography sets expectations of violence and abuse. It fosters aggression, normalization, and depiction of 
physical violence as enjoyable. It basically desensitizes and numbs the view viewer to abuse. It also serves as sex education of what they should expect in a real sexual relationship. It's sort of the use and then hate and discard approach to a relationship like Ammon and the rape of his sister Tamar in 2 Samuel chapter 13, verses 12 through 20. The line between fantasy and reality and the purpose of a sexual relationship has become blurred because of pornography. And it implies that women are always up for it. Boys learn that girls are not to be valued or respected, and they are more likely to violently abuse women when they become adults. And females learn that they're supposed to enjoy physical acts of hitting, spitting, grabbing, or slapping, or non-consensual sex. Number two, abusers may use pornographic or nude images of victims as a means of control and intimidation, also known as revenge porn. And number three, Pornography use by domestic abusers increases the odds of sexual assault. A research, research study concluded that a majority of women, 58%, whose abusers used porn acknowledged that it affected their abuse. And in another study, 40 survivors of marital rape Pornography was used by the abusers to force them to watch the porn and then enact what they saw. The solution. Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted and bind up the wounds of both the abused and the abuser. The same blood was shed, the same body was broken. Again, I implore you, abused, if you're being abused, I implore you to reach out, create a safety plan or plan of exit and seek help. Also forgive and get healing and deliverance. If you are the abuser, I implore you to reach out, to find an accountability partner, to find a support group, to also try to work with someone so you can beat this. You can't beat it on your own. Seek help, forgive, get healing and deliverance. And finally, women and girls can personally prepare for safe and productive existences by any of these following. Number one, attending forums like this to educate yourself. Number two, value who you are and know what God says about you. Number three, know that you are loved by God unconditionally and you do not have to earn his love. Number four, get a mentor so you can have courageous conversations in a safe place like this. Number five, be wise online and be careful of what you share and how much you share and who you befriend and who you communicate with. Number six, be vigilant and alert of your surroundings. And finally, know that you are confident in Christ, that he is your confidence and you can stand in him. Thank you so much and God bless you. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh Angel Duncan. At this time, we will hear from Dr. Joanne Spence, who will share and tell us about the psychological impact of domestic, of domestic violence, how to deal with sexual harassment and abuse in the workplace, and clinical support after a traumatic event. Dr. Joanne Spence. Good evening to the distinguished panel and other viewers. I want to start my presentation by sharing this with you. If a bandit breaks into someone's home and steals personal items, but on his way out, he decides to stab the individual, what happens? You go to the police, you report the matter, you go to the hospital, and you get treated for that physical wound. And then you return home. Usually traumatized, you cannot sleep, you're jumping at every sound you hear. You are re reacting that way because there's a psychological wound, but it is not really attended to. So let us say you, in the same way that you have that physical wound and it can be reinfect reinfected, so they put plaster and so on, they stitch it and they put plaster, in the very same way when you have a psychological wound, you need to be treated. And many times our psychological wound is not treated. And that's why we find ourselves in tra with trauma long after, and we are lasting consequences of this. Some of the consequences are depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and so on. 
So I want to really ask you, if you know, do you know what is a psychological wound? That's an emotional response to a traumatic event. And the trauma, traumatic event we're going to talk about this evening is domestic violence. To understand the impact, we must understand what is domestic violence. And we got an uh, explanation and a definition from our previous speaker, Dr. Angel. But it is when someone consistently aims to control their maintain power and superiority over that person. When we're looking at domestic violence, we also have to look at it and understand it in the context of culture, because we know very well that the way how society believe that men is okay for men to have two and three women. But if a woman has another man, they will say she's a slut. And let's face it, this is a fact. Then we have the societal norms, and then we have gender rules. All these areas really impact on people's behavior in terms of domestic violence. Domestic violence can pre be presented in different forms, and I want to identify two this evening. Now, all of us are aware of the physical abuse as a form of domestic violence, but because I'm dealing with the psychological impact, I want to talk about a term gaslighting, and many of us would have heard that. Gaslighting is a psychological abuse, which is very common, but some All right, we seem to have a little technical glitch. Dr. Joan uh, Spence will have dropped off a little. Um, James, I, I hope you can get her back pretty soon because I was very enthralled with her, her presentation up to that point. Dr. Joan? Okay, so Dr. Joan was giving us the psychological impact of domestic violence. And she began talking about two areas, the gaslighting, and of course we know about the physical effects that are occur, right? And while James works on the, um, the, the, the technical issues to bring back up Dr. Joan, I wanna remind each and every one of us to jot down our questions, because you recognize that we don't have a whole lot of time with each speaker. <clears throat> but there will be a time of questions afterwards. So what, what you can do, there's a, a ticker tape going across the bottom that um, tells us, yes, there it is, submit your questions by WhatsApp to 686-633-3780 or email your questions to enough at ddwc.net. <clears throat> and you can say who you're directing the questions to. And as the co host we will um, ensure that the questions get answered before the end of play today, right? We want to make maximum use of our time together, right? So once the presentations are finished, we will have question and answer time, which is going to take us uh, for the, the second half of this very important event. So, so far you would have heard from Apostle Gemma with the introduction and overview. Dr. Angel Duncan, who would have spoken to us about the red flags of abuse and abusers, the physical telltale signs of domestic violence and abuse, pornography and its impact on domestic violence, and personally preparing for a safe and productive existence as women and girls. Dr. Angel Duncan has quite a lot of experience uh, working with um, uh, victims of domestic violence and people who have been trafficked and so on. So we're very uh, privileged to have her on our panel this evening. James, anything yet? Of course, we're also hearing right now from Dr. Joan Spence, who is one of our foremost uh, psychologists. And Dr. Spence, you ready to come back in? Yes, I've just don't know where I got um, from. Go ahead. I don't know you can back up. Hello? Yes, go ahead, Dr. Dr. Spence. 
Okay, so I was sharing about the psychological wounds and I was saying that most times we would have an injury in terms of the physical injury and we would attend it. But when we talk about psychological wounds, many of us, because we don't see it, we don't recognize the need to treat with it. Um, so I said that a, a psychological wound is an emotional response to any kind of trauma. So you have a traumatic event and we're talking about domestic violence, which is a traumatic event. And we want to really look at it this evening. Um, to understand the impact of domestic violence, we must understand one, the definition, which um, we got from Pastor Angel and, and Dr. Angel. And then we also have to understand in terms of the context in which um, people behave that way. And the context we're talking about is in terms of the culture of society. We're looking at societal norms and we're also looking at gender roles. Domestic violence can be presented in many forms. And we all of us know about the physical. I want to talk this evening about, because I'm dealing with psychological, I want to talk about two aspects. One is gaslighting. What is gaslighting? Gaslighting is really a psych psychological abuse, which is very common, but sometimes is unnoticed. It's where someone would make you doubt yourself or question your sanity. So they say things like, you're overreacting. I did not mean it that way. And they make you feel that, although you have the evidence and you saw something, they're making you feel that something is wrong with you. You are mad. That is not what you saw. And they try to do that because they have a manipulative personality and they try to make you take blame for whatever they do. For instance, the person may be unfaithful and they'll say it's because you're fat, because you don't cook, because, and they give you a lot of excuses in terms of why they're behaving that way. And that is in terms of the gaslighting. The other aspect, number two, which I want to share with you, is a narcissist personality, where the person is so absorbed in self and ignores the needs of others. That per that's a personality disorder, where the person have an inflated sense of self and they need attention. So they will do anything to get attention. But that person also have a very fragile self-esteem. So that if you criticize that person as much as they are criticizing you, if you criticize that person, that person gets very angry. Those two are two aspects that really contribute also to the whole domestic violence. And I wanted to share that with you because those two aspects are really psychological and not what you can see like the physical. Um, what are some of the factors that contribute apart from that personality disorder? We have predisposing factors and we have precipitating factors. So you find that somebody may be alcoholic and that's a predisposing factor. They're alcoholic and they, they tend to want to fight and lash out and so on. A person depressed and they may want to lash out. A person who has been having a um, history of physical abuse in their family, or maybe they be a victim of abuse, they too would find themselves wanting to lash out. Then we have the precipitating factors, for instance, the economic stress based on the onset of COVID would have caused people to lose their jobs. People may be angry, they don't know how to react, and some may lash out. We have health-related issues. Somebody may just find out that they had cancer or something like that. Those persons too, out of the stress and out of the, the trauma, they tend to lash out. So those are areas where people find themselves in a situation where they lash out, all right? Um, what, is, what are some of the effects of that in terms of the, the person who is violated? What are some of the effects? Um, the person find themselves, although they're out of the situation, although they're no longer in the home, they find out for clients tell me this, listen, I moved out, I'm now by myself, but I have flashbacks, I have nightmares, um, severe anxiety, and that's post-traumatic stress disorder. So they, although they're out of the situation, they find themselves feeling that anxiety and that um, nightmares and so on. Low self-esteem, that's another area that they feel. Um, hopelessness, they feel unworthy. And one of the areas that is very common is that inability to trust someone else. You find that persons who are abused or have been in an abusive relationship for a long while, they tend to fear to go into another relationship. So they don't want to go mm -hmm. in another relationship because they believe 
that if they go in another relationship, the person might be abusive to them. The thing about domestic violence, not only the primary victim is affected, we also have the secondary victim, which would be the children or other members in the family would also be affected. And what we find happening is that children will go in school and they will act out. So we'll have be the behavioral problems. We'll have things like depression and academic problems. Those, are those things happen because the children have not dealt with the psychological wounds. How do we treat it and, and, and what kind of clinical support we'll offer for that? The first thing is to recognize that you're in an abusive situation because unlike physical abuse, psychological abuse, you don't really see anything, any evidence. So sometimes unless you're aware of what you're supposed to get, um, what you're looking for, then you don't know that you're being abused. So you have to have knowledge of recognizing yes and acknowledge you are in an abusive situation. Two, get support and remove yourself from that situation because the fact is mm -hmm. you cannot heal unless you move out of the situation. And third aspect in terms of you need to seek professional help. Um, in terms of psychological trauma, it's nothing like putting a plaster or physical plaster. You have to get a professional who understand what you have to, what you're experiencing and to help you to recover from that experience. Usually um, in psychology, we use the term cognitive behavior therapy, where we would work with a person to help them build that self-esteem. So that is my um, presentation on the psychological impact of the whole trauma. I just wanna to touch quickly on the, we have asked to, to talk about sexual harassment in the workplace. That is a very broad topic, so I will just touch on it um, tonight if I have much time. And what I want to say that sexual harassment is really someone welcomes sexual advance, um, somebody requesting sexual favors, and it can take place um, where the person decides two forms. One is where they say, okay, the boss may say, you want a promotion or you want to continue employment, well, then you would have to have some kind of relationship with me. Or you might be in a hostile, hostile environment where persons are very disrespectful, um, putting up things or playing blue type of music, suggestive and touching you when they're passing and things like that. So we have those two different aspects. Um, what really constitutes sexual harassment? When the conduct is unwanted and has the effect of creating an intimidating, hostile or, or very offensive work environment, that constitutes sexual harassment. We also have when the perpetrator attempts to influence the process of employment. So as I spoke about it just now, in terms of the employer himself will say, listen, um, you have to have a relationship with me so that I'll be able to give you further employment or some kind of sexual favors for that sort of um, favor. All right, and then we're looking at the impact of sexual abuse, uh, sexual harassment in the workplace on the victim. Psychologically, the person goes through that kind of low motivation, loss of self-esteem. They feel a sort of humiliation. They change their behavior. They start to go into isolation because they feel that, listen, I need to keep myself to myself because I don't like what's happening here. It becomes very stressful. So the person may begin to drink alcohol if they of somebody who drinks, they may drink more, all right? And these are the things that happen to that person who have, um, are experiencing sexual harassment in a good place. How do we address this? One of the first things we need to understand, listen, adopt a zero tolerance policy. You must have a policy, and many times in a good place, they don't have any policy in terms of sexual harassment in a good place. We must adopt that, that policy, and two, we need to create a a culture of reporting because you would recognize that people don't, they're afraid to go and talk about or report anything about sexual harassment in the workplace. So you have to create that culture where people feel free to report. Unfortunately, many times it might be the bosses themselves who are the perpetrators so that to have a zero tolerance policy against them or their own self may not happen. To have a reporting culture, um, it may not take place. And that's the unfortunate situation. So I want to thank you very much for this evening for allowing me to present. And I do hope that what I share with, with you will be able to assist you some way. Thank you.
Right. Thank you very much for that uh, piece of information, Dr. Spence. Next, we have uh, Mrs. Aisha Kobe, who is going to deal with actions to remove yourself from threatening situations and the environment, uh, the interventions. How should family and friends intervene? Professional treatment and support available for victims of domestic violence and rape, and how to deal with child abuse at home and church, education system, and as we commute. Let us uh, welcome Mrs. Aisha Kobe. Okay, good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for having me. I'm delighted to share this evening with this uh, very distinguished panel. I want to start by saying, in terms of educating the viewers or the listeners on what the Victim and Witness Support Unit is about, and then I'll go into the topics that Mr. White would have mentioned. So just for an understanding in terms of the Victim and Witness Support Unit, what we do at the unit is provide assistance to persons affected by crime. So it is a unit within the Trinidad Tobago Police Service. It has been established since the year 2008, and it provides support to all types of crime victims. So be it a domestic violence, a sexual offense, a road fatality, a kidnapping, any type of crime where an individual needs support or assistance, this unit is there to provide that assistance. And you may ask, well, what type of assistance? So the assistance will involve emotional support as well as guidance and, and assistance throughout the investigation and the criminal justice process. So in addition to prepping you mentally to give a statement for adventure. You may have been raped or robbed. You may also have to revisit the scene, which can be a very traumatic experience, as Dr. Spence and the previous speakers would have spoken about trauma. You would also need some support, probably, if you have to do a medical. What does that process entail? And what happens next? And sometimes it's good for victims to be aware as to what to expect so as to ease the anxiety that they may feel. And this is where the unit comes in. We also go further, especially for homicide matters. There are various layers that would follow a homicide incident. For example, you may have to, apart from being on the scene, because the victim and witness support officer can be with you on the scene. Also, you may have to go to forensics, what to expect at forensics. And also you may have to probably apply for a grant or some assistance, be it for burial, for if it be a domestic violence situation that has gone fatal. And the victim and witness support unit will provide information, guidance, and support to the victim throughout all of those stages. And as well as if you have to give evidence in court for a rape matter or so where you have to testify, you will get that preparatory support as well as you can have a victim support officer present with you at court once the magistracy would have agreed and sometimes you will do a prep session where you go and you are exposed to the court space so you have an idea as to what to expect where you may be sitting or where the prosecutors or the other um, attorneys may be so it helps to ease some of the the stress and distress that you may be associated with the intimidating space of the courtroom so for the ex for the um, conversation this afternoon when we're looking at domestic violence and the related matters. So I'm going to go in now to those actions to remove yourself from a threatening situation or environment. And that specifically really looks at a safety plan. And what does a safety plan entail, particularly in our context in Trinidad and Tobago? And one thing we would want to recommend is that for persons to know your abuser's triggers or their red flags. Sometimes you may have an idea based on the history of the incidents that would have been happening what are the things that may trigger the individual? Be it um, they may have had a, a hard day at work or they may have been drinking alcohol or some other situation that you know would normally go before an episode of abuse. Be it there's, granted there's no reason for abuse, but there would have been a trend that you would notice. So you want persons to be mindful of these things so as they can take some kind of precautions per adventure. They cannot leave in a rush or they cannot move out at that point in time. So at that point, we want to advise persons to identify safe spaces in the home, safer spaces in the home. So places that may have an exit or a window or a door, you want to gravitate to those spaces in the midst of an episode. Avoid rooms with sharp objects or, or items that can be broken and cause significant injury to yourself. 
You'll also want to be mindful of probably coming up with a code. You may want to come with that arrangement with your relatives or with your neighbors. Have a conversation with them beforehand and listen, you know, my partner also may be coming home and I suspect that this evening may be, may be difficult. There may be an assault or I may be abused. If you hear uh, a screaming or if you hear a noise, you know, um, you can call the police for me, please. Or if you see me blinking the light, the porch light blinking, incessantly that means to call the police or if you hear a sharp burst of music um um to call the police and these are some arrangements that persons can make with their neighbors beforehand have some conversations with them beforehand in the instance they have to get a response for an emergency of course also if you have persons on speed dial that would definitely help um the ttps app the SOS feature, which we would have now have an arrangement with Digicel, where you do not have to have data on your phone. You can access that option. And also, most Android phones and smart devices have an inbuilt SOS feature that you can explore so as to have persons on speed dial that can, uh, can assist in terms of an uh, uh, emergency situation. What you want to also do is look at changing your passwords frequently right um be it for your social media or for your devices be mindful of those things because these persons who abuse others they tend to manipulate and exert power and control as the other speakers would have mentioned they would normally want to go in to see who you may have been communicating with what type of interactions you may have been having and you may be held to a lot of blame and account and probably accused of having relationships with other persons so you want to be also ready to leave at a moment's notice. So normally we recommend persons to pack a bag. And this bag, we're asking that you put it in a place that, of course, cannot be seen or accessed by the abuser. And the bag should include very important information, like important documents, marriage certificates, part passports, birth certificates for the children. You may want to include medication in those bags, baby supplies if you do have young children. Um, uh, change of clothing, maybe a, a bottom and a few tops for yourself and your children and some money. So you want to pre-pack this bag and have it in a location that if you need to just grab and run, you can go with it, right? You also want to be mindful to have a cell phone. Some persons are able to afford a separate, what they call low X, a low cost phone or a me too phone, and they can just keep it on, in that bag. Or if you have your phone, you want to ensure that the phone is charged and has credit on it. I've done work with women before, and oftentimes they have a phone with a lot of credit on it, but it's just dead and they can't use it any time when they have an emergency. You want to also be mindful of having support systems that may be unknown to the abuser, unknown to the abuser, so that you have a space that you can go to. And sometimes this is difficult because in domestic violence situations, there's a lot of isolation and separation from your usual support system. So it's important to really have those healthy relationships. So if you have to go to stay with someone temporarily for safety, that it may not be a default place that the abuser would come to search after you. You wanna memorize also hotlines or of course the police contacts and other emergency contacts. And then you may also need to have an exit plan or an escape plan. And this is where, in along with the, the, the police, and now we have the gender-based violence unit, you can come up with a plan in terms of to leaving the space. Oftentimes, some persons, they may make a report and then decide to go stay with a relative or so on. However, for other intricate matters, an exit plan may be required, where you are determining beforehand the time of the day that you would leave when the perpetrator is not available. You would want to also arrange transport beforehand, the items that you would want to go with, and those things so that you can leave in a sort of seamless manner. Um, you also want to look at applying for those facilities that the state provides which would be a protection order, or be it getting legal assistance through legal aid, so that you can be sensitized about your rights and, and what is available for you. In terms of the professional treatment and support available for victims of domestic violence or rape, uh, it's important to definitely reach out for help, right? These are, these are things where the hurt does not go away if we decide to stay silent or suffer in silence. So first, I would want persons to refer to some sort of social worker or a psychologist, or you can get uh, emotional support through the victim and witness support unit as well. And that support will go throughout the investigation, medical, et cetera. 
They would also want to be mindful of support groups they can access. They could also look at the rape crisis society, the coalition against dom domestic violence, their families in actions, and other agencies locally where assistance is provided for persons impacted in particular by domestic violence. There's also the 800 safe hotline for domestic violence victims where they can access assistance. So there is assistance available both in the private and the public sector, whether or not a person is able to financially afford interventions, they can choose a private therapist or psychologist, or if they are unable to, then you have these avenues for help, which would be at no cost through the public sector, right? And just in terms of the victim and witness support unit, it's civilian officers, so it's not police officers in the unit, and it's persons that are trained in various areas of psychology, social work, and related uh, social sciences to do these types of interventions. If we go on now into um, how should family and friends intervene? Now, when persons go through these, these really traumatic incidents, as, as was mentioned before, you want to be mindful that the persons would experience a certain level of powerlessness, hopelessness, loss of self-control, fear, being embarrassed and overwhelmed. So with that whole menu of emotions mixed, it's important to, to not go in with expectations or conditions. Listen, listen, listen. It's really important for us to listen to persons that are crying out for help because oftentimes it is not their first resort. It's not their first resort to reach out for help or to ask or to leave because there is a story and a connection that would put two persons together in an intimate relationship. So to decide to want to leave, oftentimes it's not the first resort. So when they do reach out, it's important that we do give a, a listening ear because it may be a cry for help before it's too late. Avoid blaming and being judgmental to the victim that may be crying out for help, that you may have looked for it, or it's something that you may have done, or some other element of victim blaming that has been pervasive in our society. You also want to be mindful of your own personal biases or views and traditions that you may hold um, in terms of what a woman traditionally should do and what a man should do, and then Holding the female, if it's a female victim, responsible for the abuse because of her not fulfilling her gender roles or so. It's you're not treating your mates properly or you're not maintaining the home properly. Things of the, that nature is what we've heard over the years as to reasons why victims say they did not leave because it was my fault. I was doing it wrong. And my mother or my sister would have told me these things. And, and it's important for us to really break those stereotypes. Also in terms of religious views, persons are maybe of the view that we would have encountered that it's okay to, to, to pursue in the relationship where there's abuse because we need to really allow love to, to, prevail, to prevail. And this is where we would want to be very clear on those elements of our beliefs and, and how they may promote a space of, of harm for victims of domestic violence. Domestic violence is not a social or a private issue, it's a crime. So we want to really avoid solely addressing it through counseling, whether it be counseling for the, the perpetrator or the victim. But there is need for additional intervention. There is need for consequences for action. There is need to engage the authorities because oftentimes we may have seen persons who really would have been going counseling with no engagement from the authorities, and then we are faced with a, a body and we have to go to forensics. So if the victim, however, is not ready to make a report, avoid deserting them, avoid labeling them, see it, or see them as responsible for the abuse that is continuing, still continue to listen and encourage them towards reporting and getting some assistance or pursuing a space of safety. Seek assistance, and we are reaching out to friends or families. You can seek assistance on behalf of the survivor or the victim. If they're not ready yet, you speak to a psychologist, speak to a counselor, and get some guidance as to how you can speak to the victim in a healthy and helpful manner until the person is ready. Because there's a lot of fear and, and concern that would be prevailing in the person's mind. So I'm going to, and there's a lot of other stuff I could say on that, but I'm going to move on quickly now to how to deal with child abuse at home, church, the education system, and as they commute. And, and this is a very broad topic as, 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 well as we would imagine. But what I would say is that child abuse in any of those settings is against the law. 
and it must be reported. So abuse can take various forms, as we know, whether it be physical, neglect, cruelty, um, sexual in, in terms of incest, or if it is emotional, psychological, and there are other forms of abuse. But we want to really listen to children as well. If a child discloses, ensure that there's notable action taken. Counseling the parties is not sufficient. Report and support. So have the, the matter be reported so that there can be some police intervention and then have support continue. And if there are challenges in terms of the, the, the appropriate police response, then there are challenge we, channels we can explore so that that can be addressed. And when there is not a consequence of these heinous crimes against children, it sends a destructive message to them. And research would show that child abuse, especially sexual abuse, affects the trajectory of a child's life. There's research that speaks to adverse childhood experiences, which not only resound to, to emotional and psychological effects on a child, but even health challenges, even their um, propensity to suicide ideations and other factors that affect the life of the child. So child abuse is really, really key for us to not ignore, not also cause a child to hold to be responsible for the act but really explore and go further so that some sort of action can be taken for the child many adult survivors of child sexual abuse also experience domestic abuse as an adult and oftentimes in those we have seen at the victim and witness support unit is because the abuse as a child would have left unresolved, untreated, unreported. So they would have grown up wounded as, as some of these speakers would have gone before me. And it really impacts how they are able to function in social settings, relationship settings, or even choices in terms of a mate or so. So it's important how we look at um, child abuse and how we, we intervene, particularly in a church setting of, of acknowledging that these types of abuses takes place in all settings, be it religious or non-religious settings. And also abuse takes place now, not just by male relatives, but by female relatives. We also have female relatives that would perform sexual abuse on children. We have females that would perform domestic violence on males. So there is no longer just the male that is the, the perpetrator. Data shows that they are the main perpetrators, but females are still um, perpetrators of these types of very ugly offenses against our children and our women and girls. All right. So those are some of the elements I would share with you now. And I look forward to the rest of the discussion on these very important issues. So thank you very much for allowing me to share. We thank you, Mrs. Corby, for such an insightful presentation. And oh, my Lord. What information? It is not a shock. This is a lot of information to retain in such a short time. We invite you to send your questions, WhatsApp it to 633-3780 and email your questions to enough at ddwc.net. And if you can't remember, just go ahead and look at the ticker at the bottom of the screen. At this time, we want to welcome Miss Alana Wheeler, who will share counter trafficking overview and helpful tips and support for survivors. This is Wheeler. Okay, thank you very much. And good evening to Apostles Vivian and Gemma Duncan. And good evening to the members of um, Divine Destiny Worship Center. And thank you for the kind invitation to share on um, some aspects of human trafficking. A lot of information has been shared so far for the evening, so I will try very hard um, not to put too much information into the session, but only what is really required. And just to say the counter trafficking unit, we are a, a specialized unit, multi-agency, and we are directly under the Ministry of National Security. So we are not a part of the TTPS or any of the other law enforcement agencies. We are an independent agency. And our specialty is in overseeing and managing the Trinidad and Tobago government's response to human trafficking. And that entails all aspects of human trafficking, the prevention, the protection, the prosecutions, and all the partnerships that countries need to engage in to respond to trafficking. 
under the prevention, we do a lot of uh, awareness raising. We do a lot of trainings and sensitizations with different stakeholders. And we also do campaigns to educate the public on um, the signs and the red flags or the indicators of human trafficking. We also do trainings with different groups, um, public officials. Uh, we have done trainings in some of the islands of the Caribbean, virtually and in person. And we have done representations in different conferences globally and in, uh, internationally and regionally on the issue of human trafficking and Trinidad and Tobago's response. In the area of prosecution, we do have police officers who are assigned, specially assigned to the counter trafficking unit and they are specialized investigators. They investigate the human trafficking cases and they take the matters to the DPP for charges and for court. Under the area of protection, we do coordinate the government's response to providing protection and care to victims of trafficking. So we do partner and collaborate with several agencies. Um, Aisha Corby's unit is one. Uh, we partner with international organizations. We partner with churches and faith-based organizations. And we partner with many other um, agency shelters, um, reprises, many different agencies to provide the adequate and appropriate response and care to all victims of human trafficking, regardless of their nationality and regardless of their age or their gender. And I say gender suasion also. So um, partnerships, we engage in many different partnerships. So that's what we do in a nutshell. And what is human trafficking? Human trafficking, what it is not, it is not kidnapping. It is not a missing person. Uh, we, we are very sensationalized by films, Hollywood films, such as the film Taken, and uh, several films that show that a person is snatched from somewhere and they're taken somewhere and they end up being forced into prostitution or forced into some type of um, labor. Uh, yes, that can happen and kidnapping is a can be a part of the trafficking process. But generally speaking, in most cases, persons who are trafficked, they are trafficked and they are recruited by persons who they know in their society. And this evening you would have heard um, about, you know, the um, Dr. Dr. Duncan, sorry, um, Dr. Spence. She spoke a lot about the psychological impact of violence on persons. Mm -hmm. And when you think of a victim of trafficking, a victim of trafficking is subjected not only to physical violence. A victim of trafficking is subjected mm -hmm. to, in most cases, psychological violence, psychological abuse, psychological manipulation. Because this is how the perpetrators and the traffickers get them to stay in that situation. We call it sometimes modern day slavery or modern slavery, where the person is actually in bondage. And they are not bonded or bound by physical chains. They're not necessarily locked in a room or locked in a space. They are bound mentally. They are bound psychologically. They are bound emotionally. Sometimes they are bound financially because there is the issue of debt bondage where they have money that they have to pay back over a period of time. And so they have no choice but to work and to do the type of work that they're forced to do. So trafficking in a nutshell really is the exploitation of the vulnerability of persons. And persons can be vulnerable for various reasons. Persons can be vulnerable because they lack the basic amenities. Basic amenities are food, shelter, clothing, sometimes education. Um, persons, they may lack um, finances, they may lack education that they wish to pursue, they may lack a sense of belonging or feeling loved, and oftentimes most victims, we heard about self-esteem and low self-esteem, and most victims um, have very low self-esteem and very low self-worth. Many of our victims also, they have been subjected to other types of gender-based violence. And when I say other types of gender-based violence, many victims come from a home environment where they have been subjected to incest, um, sexual abuse, rape by family members, um, physical abuse and domestic violence, or they may have witnessed that type of violence against their, of, of their parents, mother or father, and, or in their community, they may have been subject to that in their community. So a victim of trafficking, most times the, the experience of abuse uh, is, it's not the first time that they've experienced it. They would have experienced it before and they would have, um, I use the word, graduated into a worst form of abuse or gender-based violence. And human trafficking is a type of gender-based violence. So 
persons can be vulnerable also if they are migrants and they are irregular migrants. What is an irregular migrant? An irregular migrant is someone who does not have a regular immigration status in the country. So that person may have entered the country um, illegally, not through a legal port of entry. That person's time may have expired while they were in the country um, and they end up becoming an irregular migrant. And so those persons are vulnerable because now they can be reported to the authorities and whoever is caring for them or seeing about them locally may decide to use that against them or use that over their head, as we say in Trinidad. So uh, the, any type of vulnerability, there are persons, there are victims we have had who have, were looking for love and ended up in a, 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 an engagement relationship and only to discover that the fiancé was actually someone who ended up becoming their pimp and exploiting them. So we have had victims also who look to pimps or they look to traffickers um, because they want to belong to a family and the trafficker makes them feel a part of the family. And we know about the whole issue of Stockholm Syndrome. We can't get into that. We have other experts who could treat with that, but there is the challenge of the Stockholm Syndrome where the victim feels that allegiance and that loyalty to someone who is exploiting them. We have um, victims where the trafficker treats them really, really well. Um, they, they wine them, they dine them. Um, they're kind to them, very kind to them, very generous to them and for a period of time. And then on a one-off moment, they are then asked to do small favors for the trafficker, right? In exchange or in lieu of the, in, in the kindness. In other words, in payment for the kindness that that person is extending to them. So the victim feels a sense of indebtedness. You have been so kind to me and so good to me that I really would feel badly if I say no, if you ask me to do something for you. And that's an example, for example, of what pimps will do. What the pimps do is that they recruit um, persons as their girlfriend or boyfriend, and they treat them as a girlfriend or boyfriend. And then after a while, they then ask them to, to pay back or to do favors so that they can continue a particular lifestyle that that pimp has been offering the girlfriend or the boyfriend. I want to touch a little bit on the issue of grooming and particularly fishing online, um, fishing and grooming. And grooming is a major aspect of the recruitment part of, a, of the trafficking where persons now, because many persons are online and Dr. Angel Duncan mentioned the, I, the issue that persons are online. So many persons are being groomed online. And we know about meeting someone and sometimes the, the face that you see on the online profile is not actually the person. The person may actually be a much older person or maybe somebody of a different gender or different sex. And when you think you're speaking probably to a teenager, teenager to teenager, you're actually speaking teenager to adult male or a male in his 60s. And so you find that there is a lot of that grooming because, you know, young people have a lot of time on their hands during the COVID period and there is a lot of online activity. So you find that unknown to parents, uh, the young persons are online at all hours of the night, all hours of the daytime, unsupervised uh, with devices. And they are not, young persons can't handle what comes with, with, with um, owning these devices, right? So they get into all sorts of strange websites out of curiosity and they end up meeting persons online. And we have had victims who were recruited online and through online chat rooms and chat groups. And they ended up traveling from one country to another country and ended up being exploited. So that's the reality of what we're dealing with. The grooming can also take place through a close member. We have what you call sexual grooming, which is an offense. It is a criminal offense under the Children's Act. It's a criminal offense under the Sexual Offenses Act. And... Um, it's a serious offense against um, minors, mainly happens to minors, but you also have adults who may end up being groomed by traffickers. And that grooming oftentimes takes place with someone you trust. And earlier in the evening, we heard about um, trusting persons. Yes, it's important to trust persons, but as parents and as guardians, we are to be mindful of who we expose our children to. Immediate family, uncles, aunts, nephews, nieces, grandparents, um, friends of, you know, parents of the children that we hang around with and all these things, they can be persons who could be grooming your children. And we have had cases where um, traffickers have groomed the children 
or groomed even the parents by helping out the family, being kind to the family, being like a godfather to the family, um, meeting a need in that family's life. And then, of course, because the trust has been built, they can then take the person that they're targeting and isolate them. So that person, that victim believes that this person who's grooming me is the only person I can trust, the only person who really cares about me, the only person who's going to be there for me. Mommy and daddy doesn't care about me. Teacher doesn't care about me. Nobody else cares about me except this person. And so the person is, the, the, the trafficker is able to lure them or even the abuser, because it could be for sexual abuse or other types of abuse. You're able to lure them into your arms, open arms, and then you are able to manipulate them and make them think or feel. So a lot of the trafficking process has to do with what we call coercion, which is psychological coercion more than the physical coercion. And once you're psychologically coerced, once the, the person has your mind, they basically have you. They're then able to control and to manipulate you. So um, I think that's what I would say in a nutshell in terms of, of what the trafficking process is. Uh, for persons, uh, we, we are thankful to churches and faith-based organizations who provide tremendous support because the, the problem and the issue of trafficking is a spiritual problem. So it must be addressed not just uh, nationally and not just financially, emotionally, psychologically, but it is a spiritual problem. And this is where churches and faith-based organizations are able to mend and heal and bring restoration and rehabilitation to victims because they have also been spiritually damaged, tremendously spiritually damaged, and they need to be restored. And on that note, I will end and hand back to the uh, facility, the, um, sorry, the host. Thank you very much, Ms. Wheeler. Those are some very deep thoughts coming on uh, counter trafficking and the support for survivors. Uh, you realize, folks, that uh, the time is upon us, but I want you to understand that the, the, the benefits, uh, we have quite a lot of questions coming in, keep them coming. Um, we're going to see how far we can push it with the time. Our next presenter, however, Mr. Patrick McMillan, is going to talk to us about personal protection and the safety and security awareness and mindset that is necessary. Mr. McMillan, please. Thank you very much, and pleasant good evening to all. And I must say it's a pleasure for me to come and deliver this, a few pointers with respect to security. Now, within the whole world of security and personal protection, it's a wide, it's a vast area. But I would like to synchronize this afternoon to some important pointers or takeaways that we could use in our own protection. In providing protection for ourselves, it is not about guns and bombs and driving down the road in a tank so that we cannot be impacted by the crime that exists. The most important factor for us in the whole security environment, it's your power of observation. You could make that note down. You could take that down as a safety tip. The power of observation, being able to see something before it occurs being able to see that person looking suspiciously the corner or how many meters ahead of you. What would happen once you recognize that? Once you recognize that, you will begin to take adverse actions. You will begin to take preparatory moves in order to put forward a maneuver to whatever type given situation. You may be totally wrong in it, but at the same time, you could be totally right. But it's all about your ability to observe something before it happens, to observe something as it builds up. People who are offenders always look for the easiest target. They may have 10 persons there that they could rob, but the one that they feel they could get away easily, that is the one that they target. So it's about making yourself more difficult uh, to be attacked by these, these um, people and these type of bandits. Now, there would be at times you are in what I would describe as a controlled environment or uncontrolled environment. These are controlled environments, uh, areas that you are in, that you're secured. For example, we are in church worshiping. There's a filtration system before people enter the car park. There's a management process 
And in that way, it filter people coming in. And there you are sitting under the, the safety and security of what is provided in that space. It could be a place of entertainment. It could be your job where you are. And there is a, a certain security cordon that we must have checkpoints before you enter into that place. So you have a higher percentage of safety in those environments. But the greatest challenge that would exist is when you leave that place of safety to go to another place. That another place can be your car. It could be into another building. But you are going to be exposed in that uncontrolled area, in that area where most people have access to and they could come forward to harm you. So these are the areas you do not want to relax. These are the areas that you want to have that extra level of alertness that would be more than on your desk, on your job. Because you know there would be some measure of security filter so you could relax in that space. You could relax within your home. You know your gate is locked, your door is locked, your windows are secure. But the minute you leave the safety of your home and you step out, you are into an uncontrolled environment that is not always managed by appropriate security. And people have access to you. So once you go into this space, it is where you're going to use your most important weapon, your power of observation. You could stay from inside your house and look out in the morning before you go to work, look around your car. Um, it don't have to be, you know, you stressing yourself looking, but in your casual movements, you pay special attention to these things. And you approach a vehicle, once you close your door, obviously you would see how necessary it may be to lock it. That's another level of security that you're inside, that you have protected yourself with. So in these pointers thus far, I just needed to recognize the most important tool that you have is your power of observation. Don't water it down. Don't reduce it to anything less. Because before you begin to operate, before you begin to function, you need to know something is happening. Whether you pick it up through your sensory mechanism, your air, your eye, or for whatever reason. Okay? So we continue. You would have your cell phones. You may get calls in that uncontrolled environment, that uncontrolled space. It's up to you to make a decision to choose if you feel comfortable to engage yourself in these conversations. Um, you may not want to initiate your call until you get into that safe area. People may call you, you see who is calling you. You may just let it ring until you reach there. Sometimes you may find, um, because of where you are, you don't even want to tell them, look, I'll call you back, or have them return a call to you, okay? So you now need to select your space as you go about your life, because the thing about it, we are under threat, all of us. Yes, women feel that extra level of vulnerability, and as a consequence, once you recognize that you are a target, it is necessary for you to employ these security procedures. Now, if you are driving your car, you're on the road, and you suspect that someone is following you, what do you do? Do you speed up? Do you drive faster? Once you do that, you put yourself in danger. You could continue with the normal speed that the road allows you to. Of course, you cannot drive at a, drive at a highway speed on the, the normal secondary road, okay? But what you will be looking for along your route, <clears throat> and this is something you should do on a daily basis, if there is something like a roundabout, once you are approaching a roundabout and you suspect someone is following you, you go around that roundabout at least twice. If the person is following you, they may make some other maneuver, or if they want to go around the roundabout twice like you, <clears throat> well, then it's obvious. You may not always have a roundabout. You may have a block in your area that you could use with that same roundabout skill set type ability. All right? And these are things that you use to kind of confirm it may shake off, and of course, you don't want to drive directly in your home, the nearest police station. Now, this is a plan that you need to have before. You look at your route from work to home, or your place of entertainment to home, or your place of worship to home, and in your mind, you need to factor these things. Now, remember, the more difficult you make yourself, they would always go for an easier target, okay? And that is one of, the, one of the principles. Now, let's look at your keys. 
Do we have keys with our names on it? Do we have keys where we went somewhere and they gave you a nice gift, you, you, you know, uh, with your name on it and next to the Eiffel Tower and you feel so proud you have that in your keys? What you're doing is identifying yourself to people. If they steal your bunch of keys, it goes missing. They may have information there on that tag, maybe where you live, or they know which car to go to because this is the car of the victim because her name is there. And you give them lots of information. What you can do is color code your keys. Now, it might be more easier for you to do that with your house. You don't want to be walking around with a bunch of keys, eight, 10 plus keys, whatever, you know, next thing you're someone like Santa Claus doing a jingle bell jog there, you know, a set of noise when you're walking, or maybe even the handbag. You would like when you go to that door to open your door, within whatever bunch you have, you must be able to quickly identify which is that key for your front door. You don't want to be at your front door searching for your keys. You could go ahead and have your keys color coded. For example, if you could see here with my keys, they have different colors. There's a blue, there's a lighter blue. There is, I have a, uh, almost red, I have a green. And these keys, I know which of these keys is my front door. I have these two keys here for my front door. I know this green is my burglar proof gate. My burglar proof gate is painted in green. So I selected a green covering, okay? Then my wooden door, I couldn't get one that is brown in color. So the closest color that is available, I took that, all right? And these are other colors, again, for other locations, all right? Now, all these things help minimize your time in entry to your control area, to your safe area. And these are the methods that you want to function with. Someone may try to engage you in conversation. You have them, let's say, as a guest at your house. When they are leaving, don't involve yourself in too much conversation in that uncontrolled area outside the door. Most of your conversation, you want that to occur internally. So once they are leaving, that's it. If for some reason you perceive or you have evidence that you are actually under a threat, whether from a gender perspective or there's solid information, you, you see much more reasons to employ all these principles. But it can be a general daily lifestyle where you could begin to change your life and you don't want to look panicky in doing these things, but you just allow it to be part of your routine. The same way you would go out before you leave ho your home, you'll have your shoes on, you'll have your clothing on, you would have whatever is necessary to accompany you. In the same way, these security principles is what you now want to be part of your lifestyle for your protection, making yourself the harder target. If you have a new house, of course, you want to change those keys. Don't complain and say, it's too expensive to get locks for there. Value your life. See what is, determine how, how much value your life is and you realize the keys are so cheap as compared to you, okay? Um, your house lighting, it's important for appropriate external lighting and invest in good security cameras. If you have big trees around your house that shows a shadow or darkness that someone could hide and secure yourself, be aware and change those things. Have it trimmed, have it manicured, whatever, but you need to start to think more about you, all right? In your house design, well, it's always appropriate if you are building the house, but this is just another point I would like to put out to you. It's always good to have a safe room. That is, for some reason, you suspect people breaking into your house and they're coming in at you. There's somewhere you know you could go and secure yourself, at least for a period of 24 hours. And um, sometime you may have little accoutrements in there that will help sustain you for those period of hours. All right? So those are some important safety tips I would like to leave you with. And always remember that familiar... Uh, um, well, proverb, see something, say something. You may see people hanging around and it's not somebody you are accustomed with for that area. What is their reason? Ask yourself that question. Don't tell yourself you look beautiful today and it's how you dress and look nice. That is why they're watching you. And maybe they are. 
but it might be a package deal. It might be more than one purpose. Okay? So with those few pointers, I would just like to thank you guys very much for the opportunity to share. Of course, there's much more that we could share on this, but in the not too distant future, I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to so do. So I thank you very much. Any questions that you have, you can put it in online and we'll follow you up as a consequence. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Macmillan. Wow, wow, wow. Your best weapon, the power of observation. Yeah, color code your keys, have a safe room. Very, very uh, important advice to safeguard ourselves. So we're coming down to the last presenter, Mr. Anthony Walcott, who's going to talk to us about the practical tips to safeguard yourself. Some more practical tips. Uh, use of non-lethal weapons. Um, and he will also give us a little idea of um, the follow-on training that will come next, the next steps. Um, and these next steps will bring us to, um, to some, some actual hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat and self-defense and so on. So over to Mr. Anthony Walcott. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for allowing me this, this privilege with this distinguished group. I want to talk about recognizing situations that threaten your safety. Any situation or person that attempts to isolate or restrain you without your conscious consent, non-threatening, preparation, being prepared is not paranoia. This is not a break from today's reality. To remove yourself from any situation, it is very good to do self-defense and honored combat and understand the mechanisms of releasing holes. But what must be applied to successfully negotiate that situation? If nothing else, if you remember nothing else, remember this. Ferocity, fury, unrestrained, sustained, calculated, violent action. Unrestrained, and it's not for a while. Sustain, continue, calculated, decide when you will start violent action that is what will get you out all the martial arts technique you will know those three things those four things most of these perpetrators of these deadly offensive actions against women they have chemical structural or spiritual challenges they cannot be reasoned with they are repeat offenders and they have successfully performed some of these things before. They are empowered by your pleas and your tears. You should only cry or beg to distract them or deceive them. Your reaction should be pre planned. However, there's always the element of surprise. If you are not legally armed with an offensive weapon, carrying it in your person, there are laws. It is against the law to have anything that is made, like a firearm, a dagger, a flip nice brass knuckles, adapted like a cutlass or a cricket bat that you're not using carrying it, or intended like noxious fluid. You cannot have carry concealed acid or large stone, you will be arrested if found. However, the equipment with which we can legally supply ourselves with and many articles for defense and responsive protection. A multiple tool pack. This is not an offensive weapon. You can have something like this, a sturdy pen, 
in different parts of your person. These things must be easily accept, accepted. So when you reach for them, you need to know where to place your hand and fetch it. And the article must be prepared. If you have, you're definitely going to have your, your pliers out. Many persons have been issued with firearms and they are still being murdered. There are people who are cleaning their cars. They have a firearm, but they fire them inside and it's not accessible. And they have been murdered in Trinidad and Tobago. Your ladies, your teeth to tear and rip your elbows, your head, your feet. The situation may start in a confined space. Someone who's been transported should not ask, where are you taking me? Where are we going? You have been taken. You're not asking that. Stop. Stop now. Stop immediately. That's what you're stating. If there's no compliant, the survival thought mindset must step in. Nobody must take you, of course without your permission first. Calculate when you're going to do it. If you got to push a wheel when they're turning a corner, when your seat belt is on, on do not stop. Sustained fury. Don't start. Don't beg. And young lady, all she wanted to do was to go home and she begged. Fury, maximum ferocity. They must realize that they did not capture or hold a weak person. You claim God, Jesus, you are in charge. And you start your action calculated. Understand that you can or may be hurt or injured but you will survive you will win in fact you have been winning since inception against overwhelming odds tremendous odds each trial you won and that is why you are here right now alive in our next session we will discuss personal preparation in details and what you can do to equip yourself for these activities. You may wish to look up the most dangerous woman, Freddie Gibbs story. The time is short. In our other sessions, we will deal with your personal situation and give advice. Thank you very much. Wow, wow, wow. What a wealth of information we are receiving this evening. I'm sure that you are taking your notes and we continue to get questions and we continue to invite you to either message or email your questions. At this time, we want to reintroduce Apostle Gemma Duncan, who will advise us on the role of the church in the prevention and cure of domestic violence and abuse. Apostle Gemma Duncan. She's always been with us as a society. And uh, with every ill, the prevention and cure must begin in our homes. If we can fix the homes, we can fix or attempt to fix the scourge of abuse. In the church, our aim is to equip both the potential abused and the abuser. Uh, many times I know we've dealt much more with the abused than the abuser, but we have to uh, help the abuser to deal with the pains and the triggers as well as the abused. We often say abuse the people who abuse people and hurt people hurt people. In the case of the abuser, as well as the abused, forgiveness must be preached, practiced, and exemplified to those people. Because 
most times, or almost all the time, people who are abusers have been abused in some form in their homes. And as you've heard from, I mean, the, the, the panelists, fascinating information, uh, just too short in each case. Um, we have had all kinds of triggers and, 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 and things that happen to people, especially in the home in their formative years, that will cause them to become abusers. And we have found in our own little corner, uh, you can't change the world, but you can change, at least attempt to change one person at a time, that forgiveness is absolutely important. Uh, Apostle Vivian, I've been to prisons, and I mean, you, this kind of men um, that you meet there, and he would preach forgiveness. That's his only message if, when he goes to prison. And uh, it will break your heart. He and all will cry when you see the size and the kind of men who would begin to break down. I remember we were in uh, Guyana at one time, and one of the prisoners of the Rupununi, he said to him, Pastor, you should have been around when I was a little boy. If somebody had uh, preached to me or taught me the power of forgiveness, then I may not have been in this situation. The abused, as we've heard, uh, must learn defense. And most of the uh, speakers uh, talked about it, and the church's role is to reinforce some of the things uh, that were said. Uh, defense, in terms of the practical one, as Anthony shared, defense in terms of preparation. Uh, uh, our role is to reinforce the skills that and values that are taught in the homes, and in the event that these were not taught in the homes, then uh, we, uh, the church becomes the surrogate for the homes, and so Many times we found that the role of the church and the pastors, you become the, the fathers and the mothers and uh, the senior people in the church, the elders we, we, we would consider, are the ones who would help the young people and the older ones as well to deal and treat with uh, um, the circumstances and the situation. We have to uh, convince the abuser, as was said, that there's life after abuse as hard as it is. We know if you're not in that person's position, it's very difficult to do. And what we try to do is use people who've had experience so that um, they are more convincing, they're more believable, they're more credible, because there are people who have gone through stuff. And if somebody comes in for help and you are uh, exposed to that person, then you will believe. And chances are, um, whatever is discussed will stay there because that person would have had um, the situation there. So it's important that the church provides a forum where somebody is free to confide and uh, uh, where we will deal with honest and frank conversations and that there is confidentiality and that there is credibility. Uh, I, I heard one of the speakers and she talked about the church and um, our propensity to, well, suggest forgiveness and not believe that it should go further in terms of reporting to the police and so on. Well, I don't believe in that. I believe that um, if a crime is committed, it should be reported to the police. I know it is not easy. We've been in the, in the position. It's a hard decision to make. And um, however, uh, if we don't report many things that the perpetrators will continue to do it right and and so that we empower the perpetrators and so uh we know i agree with her that um you should go to the police now i'll tell you something uh we've had situations where we included the police and the victim refused to um go further with the situation they didn't want to um you know because it's a loved one you didn't want the consequences and all that so it's it's it's, it's a whole lot of things that we have to work with but as I said, if we could help one person at a time, we would have done another. One of my favorite things is, especially for women, is what I call preparation for flight. And I tell women that you have to prepare yourself with marketable skills and education that will provide financial independence. In my little limited experience, Finances is one of the big, 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 big things that cause people to remain in abusive situations, right? And so 
I, I don't believe sometimes we are too lax with our youngsters or daughters. They don't want to do this and they don't want to do that. And, and we say, well, the child don't really want to go to school or she doesn't want, she's not interested. Well, we're going to have to find something that that child is interested in and make sure that that child is prepared for what I call flight. I am going to stop because I know the time is almost gone and um, our, our people, uh, we have questions and uh, definitely we know that we're going to have to have a part two. Some of these speakers, to my mind, they could be let loose by themselves to do an entire program I'm sitting here because of the wealth of the experience. But I'm going to turn over to um, the host. The church has a role to play, and we are going to play the role in collaboration with the agencies that will now expose. Not that we know, because we will now be able to hand over and pass over to people who come to us to many of these agencies. Amen. We definitely agree with you, Apostle Gemma. Each presenter, we could sit down and if we start to take notes, it, we will be here for quite some time. So let's see what we can do about that part too. Amen. Well, we've been here for a while taking in information. Some of our heads are spinning. Some of us have to stop some learned behaviors, like after we finish lying inside, go straight outside and go home. No lining outside the gate. So at this time, we want to take a breath with some music. I want to let you know that after that segment, after that song rather, we will resume with our question and answer session for about 30 to 45 minutes. At this time, however, breathe and enjoy a musical presentation by Minister Marissa Humphrey.
King, all I have and now I'm laying it at your feet. Oh, you have every failure, God. You have every victory. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Marissa Humphrey, for that most appropriate song. Okay, we're going to get right into our question and answer session. I know um, James is going to bring up all our presenters. Um, some of the questions may not um, be directed to a particular um, presenter. So if you feel you're competent to answer, just jump in um, and give it a go. Those that are specific, we will indicate, both Francine and I will indicate to who the question is being posed. Um, let us be very crisp with our answers because we've already uh, close to our end time, but we're gonna push the envelope just a little bit so that we can get the benefit of the question and answer session. So our first question, and we have quite a few. What does an abused person do if their abuser is someone who is a member of law enforcement or someone with judicial influence. Reporting a crime about a person like this can be difficult if they are able to cover their tracks. First question. Any takers? Okay, so I'll jump in there. <laughs> Right, and, and it is um it is a phenomenon it is something that definitely happens um currently uh, that persons especially victims who are victimized at the hands of law enforcement police officers prison officers as well as the judiciary they think not just twice but often times several times as to whether they should come forward what i would advise that um victim to do is first get in contact with someone you can speak to a victim and witness support officer for some guidance first before going to make a report um whilst we aim for full confidentiality and response to all reports unfortunately we haven't reached that in terms of perfection or absolute terms at this point um so i would recommend that they engage a victim and witness support officer or they can speak with a police officer first sometimes a police officer that may be known to them if they have concerns because we know in many instances through the gbv unit they would have been investigated a number of high level colleagues as well as some of some agencies but there still are some instances where you may make a report against a, a police officer or a high-ranking official and the information may reach the official or the investigation may not go as it should go I would advise that person to get some guidance first uh, so that they can get um, a plan towards reporting to promote um, their safety and also a response that is, is fitting of the report and the offense that is happening. Thank you very much, Ms. Corby. 
I'll let my co-host uh, bring the other question. I hope um, that was sufficiently answered for you. Go ahead, Fran. Amen. Uh, what are some tips one will give to parents who need to monitor young children on the internet? With distance learning, monitoring them is so much more difficult since they have to be on the internet most of the time. Anybody can go. Uh, if you don't mind, I would start. Um, I mean, I know that there are adult police officers in the room who will be able to give another perspective, but um, you want to secure the children from a parenting perspective and also from a security perspective. I've shared my personal views with respect to children having devices, particularly young children. And if, if the child... Um, does not need the device for classes, it should be taken away from them. So they don't need to have the device at night um, after classes have ended. It should be taken from them and it should be secured. While classes are going on, there are certain software that parents can put in the computer, the laptop or the cell phone, where you could actually monitor or mirror what your child is viewing online. So if it is that the parent is of the view that they have to take that extreme measure to monitor the child's online activity, then I strongly suggest that they do that. Um, of course, in addition to, of course, having somebody supervising or overseeing them while they are online doing classes, they're not doing classes 24 hours a day. They're not doing classes even for eight hours stretch um, consecutively. There are breaks in the classes. So if there is someone at home who could sit with them while they're doing the classes, and when the class is not in session, then they could remove themselves from the device and do something else until they wait for the next class. I mean, it sounds that that, that will apply to parents who have the resources to do that, because I know some parents just don't have the resources. But um, ideally, if you can monitor what they're doing, and as I said, you're not in class, you don't need to have the device on you. That's just my view on it, thanks. Fair enough. Uh, Mr. Walcott? It is a parent's duty to check after. If you do not have the technical competence, there are families who can check. They, I always check. My son is 31 years. He lives in my home. I asked my daughter, Dr. Walter, check your brother's computer. He lives in my home. There are rules. We cease to be parents. We are too, I'm your parent, I'm your friend, I'm responsible for your health, physical and mental. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Walcott. Yes, Mr. McMillan. And it's and you, very important for us as parents to get yourself familiar with the computer and all these necessary skill set to function as a supervisor. Secondly, it's very important you have that computer so positioned, you may not always have to enter the room to see it, but from that door, you can see it. Of course, you need to check as well whatever possible audio that you could pick up. There are different methods. You don't always make your approach the same every time, but supervision is necessary. Thank you. Thank you very much for this cogent answers. So our third question, this is kind of long and watery. Do you think the reason most women don't unite is because of culture, race, ethnicity, and power? We feel sympathetic for each other when our life is lost. But I believe if we really unite as we should, we can make a difference. Will a law ever be put in place to protect us women? I think there are some laws. And if they do, it's still operated by men, the same gender that's hurting us, not saying all men are bad. Will there be institutions of some sort to equip women about the effects of abuse and how to handle abuse? Dr. Spence? 
It is a real long um, why the question, but um, it's a good question. I know the, the caller is, the, not the caller, but um, the person who asked the question is concerned about safety, um, is a concern about women getting together to help each other. Um, I think that's a, one of the main points in terms of we as women, we need to support each other as much as possible. And it goes back to even when sometimes a, a domestic violence situation at home and other women who live in the neighborhood might be aware of it and many of us don't really give any kind of support. So I think what the um, person is really asking is what kind of support we as women could to give to each other to help us in terms of dealing with our own abuse. Um, so that's very important as women that we need to support each other. We need to understand that there are strength in numbers. So if you're aware that your neighbor is um, being abused, what can you do? You can report, you can go to the person and see what kind of support that they need, things like that. Um, in terms of the point that they made concerning persons um, who made the law, the abusers of the law, we have to also understand that not all men are abusers. Um, we need to understand that. And I did, they did make that point. Um, so somebody, we have to trust somebody to do, to make a start. And therefore there are laws and we have to trust that the lawmakers would be able to carry out the laws. So that's my um, point on it. Thank you very much. Anybody else would like to add to that? All right, in the interest of time, um, we'll ask the next question. How can a woman raise a strong daughter being after being abused mentally, emotionally, or physically, basically any type of abuse? And I wonder, I want to go to Mama. Apostle Gemma, please. Uh, the thing is, uh, that's one of my 40. I love strong women. we not liked, usually, by both genders. <laughs> but we are survivors and we learn how to thrive. Um, for a woman to raise a strong daughter and uh, strong in all the good sense that we mean, she herself has to exemplify that. Um, so if she has been in a situation where she was initially abused, then that person would have had to get healing, counseling, uh, treated with, you have Dr. Spence and all the people who have all the qualifications to help. You have to be helped because um, you're not going to assist your daughter if you are trailing hurts and so on. Uh, you have to get rid of your bitterness because um, these things and um, you're not blaming that person for being bitter and, and, and um, unforgiving. But uh, remember, forgiveness is for you more than the other person. Uh, remember, we said that despite um, the fact that you will report to the police and a person might be jailed for a particular uh, infringement, uh, you still have to forgive the person because forgiveness frees you. So I would say that that person has to begin with themselves. Make sure that you're healed. Make sure that, that your daughter sees a, a, liber, a free woman. And uh, be honest in your conversation with your daughter. Uh, we've grown up in my time, at my age, um, where um, parents didn't really talk. Uh, the older folk didn't tell you anything. Uh, I don't know if they felt that they were, um, well, uh, protecting us by not telling. And uh, we need to have honest conversations with our daughters. Tell her why um, you seem uh, so diff uh, stringent. Tell her why you seem overprotective because tell her when she's ready, there's a time that she will be ready, she'll be asking questions and so on. And explain to your daughter your experiences and why you are the way you are. Many times, the youngsters don't understand why the mother is behaving like that. You're overprotective and they think you don't want them to have fun and all of that. And if we, are, if we have these honest conversations with our daughters, then I believe that um, uh, we could help them. As I said before, then your daughter convince her she needs to be equipped for flight. And so you want her to have skills training. You want her to have marketable skills. You want her to be educated. And every time she seems a little discouraged, remind her again why it is absolutely necessary for her to be educated. 
Uh, one last point, I know there are other questions are because there are many other things that we could say. Um, we need to listen. Uh, many times uh, we, as parents, we talk more than we listen. We have to listen to our children. Listen to your daughter. Let her talk. Let her share um, her heart with you. Um, sometimes uh, we need to allow them to even criticize us. It hurts, but we get a sense of how they really feel and we see ourselves through the mirror of their own eyes. And when that happens, we get a real sense of how that child views us because your daughter must believe, must be convinced that she can come and talk with you. You're going to believe her um, and you are going to do something about her situation. Um, somebody else may want to comment. Anybody want to add to that? Okay, Ella Fran. Yes. What are some of the areas of support I can implement as a neighbor being aware of abuse around me? Go ahead. Okay, so as a neighbor, some of the some of the points that I may have mentioned in terms of the safety plan, I think you may want to have a conversation with the neighbor if you all have that type of arrangement or relationship. You may want to have a conversation with the neighbor. If, however, there is some level of hostility or there isn't a cordial interaction between yourself and a your neighbor, but you are aware of abuses taking place. This is where you can also engage uh, a neutral but responsible third party. For example, somebody from the, the victim of the support unit. We've gotten reports from neighbors who just want to anonymously indicate that you know their neighbor is experiencing abuse and if we could get involved. And that is where we can engage with the police officers for that area and see how we could tactfully get involved. We can also get involved from different avenues, be it from the school, if there's a child in the home, and engage in the teachers or so at the school, so as to reach to the source of the issue. So, the, of course, the first option is if you can have a conversation, non-judgmental, just genuine interest. Um, victims of domestic violence tend to be somewhat very um, defensive sometimes up front because of the hurt and embarrassment and fear that they feel. They may deny it uh, initially. But this is where, based on your engagement and your sincerity and that conversation and how you approach the person, would seek to allow them to maybe share or trust you or believe that you generally want to assist. And if they do not respond, if they do not um, take your advice, please don't stop. Please explore another avenue and want this pass to someone else. Um, because we would have recalled two years ago in Larbury, even though it may not have been the landlord's business or the school's, the school child's business, they all were killed in a domestic violence incident. So it remains everybody's business. So if you don't get a response or so from the victim themselves, you can engage a, a member of the authority, for example, the victim and witness support unit to see how we can intervene tactfully. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Corby, and thank you, Apostle, for the last answer. This, this, this question will bring um, Dr. Angel into interview. How do women move away from the stigma of shame for being in an abusive relationship? This is what prevents them from reporting it in the first place and staying shame. So how do they do that? Dr. Angel? Sure. Well, thank you for the question. Well, I, I believe the first thing is the um, individual needs to come to the realization that the abuse that they experienced was not their fault. A lot of times the victims will take it on themselves and say, it is my fault. This is why I was abused. And even the person abusing them will uh, coerce or make them manipulate them to believe that um, they are responsible for the, the abuse that they delivered to them. So that's another thing they need to overcome. Um, my suggestion would be um, connecting with other 
women, meaning like reaching out and connecting with perhaps a mentor, per connecting with another leader in in your community, um, church, um, a counselor, someone who can actually um, speak life into you or help you come to that realization that it is not your fault. And then um, acknowledging and realizing that you as an individual, you have rights, you know, you have, have the right to, to live as a human being. You have, you have the right to be respected. You are valuable. And I know it may not be easy for them to, to receive that after going through so much abuse, but that is the, the route I would suggest. They would need to report it, you know, because there should be a consequence for any, um, violence or abuse against any human being. So they should report it, but they should also, um, you know, get connected with other resources, agencies, community institutions, um, individuals, other family members, someone they can trust who can help them to come to the realization that it is not their fault. And then begin to walk through that healing process go through um, counseling, go through um, a restored program of some sort for yourself, for your children. And it will take time, you know, um, it will take time, but it is definitely um, a step-by-step -step journey and re recovery is possible, healing is possible, a new start is possible and fulfilling your destiny is still possible. You just have to believe that. Thank you so much, Dr. Angel. Listen, bear the shame for a while, but please, please, please stay alive. Another question. What are we, go what are we doing to hold our young men accountable? There are so many sessions for women that inform us on how to avoid violent situations. But what are we doing as a nation to address young men? Again, this could anybody could start in terms of addressing the young men one of the th approaches that i have used um when the person the victim comes i try to get or to the perpetrator also because of course something is wrong with that person um psychologically whatever some pain they are paining too and that's why they are um, inflicting pain on that other person so i try to get onto that person and allow them to come for counseling and deal with the issues in terms of what, so we do background in terms of what are the history of that person? Why would, what would have caused them to behave that way? And then we try to work with them to help them change their behavior. So um, my approach has always been, you have to look, work with both the victim and the perpetrator. Um, and that's where we will get results. So that's one of my approaches. I'd like to add in addition, um, excellent Dr. Joanne Spence, in addition with the young men, I, I would say there needs to be some intentional efforts to reach the young men in our communities. You know, um, there's so much that the young men have gone through, you know, they're dealing with other issues, fatherlessness, they're dealing with their own rejection, they're dealing with anger, um, the economy may be an obstacle for them. What I would say is the, the community, we as a community, we, we need to be intentional in reaching out to our young men to build them up, to speak to them. Even the, the when I say young men, I'm even talking the boys um, because our um, culture, you know, globally is overly sexualized. And so everything is coming at them at a rapid pace. And the images are everywhere. I mean, you can't watch a commercial. Um, you can't look on your phone. You can't look on television without some um, normalization of, of uh, sex, oversexed images or images of women um, being, you know, abused or, you know, seen as, you know, object, not, you know, not something to be valued. So I feel if we as a community um, can begin to intentionally target our young men because we do, I, I believe we, we really do do great 
and there could be more done with women but i mean i'm excited and encouraged by the things that have been accomplished and that are being done to help the young women we do need to reach out to the men and the young boys and um and i mentioned specifically boys because earlier age the better based on just you know early training childhood development and all of that so um that's my thought and that may look like in the forms of mentorship that may look like in the forms of apprenticeship you may have a skill and you you can um take a young man in your community under your wing and teach him your trade teach him your business teach him your skill all the while building that relationship and having those courageous conversations about life about goals about women and so on so i'm gonna stop there but that's my uh take on that as well thank you dr Pat. duncan sorry i can i just add one minute to that please sure. Francine? Sure. okay just sure. justin and i underscore everything that dr angel just said and i just want to say a, a few things men are not the enemy that's one and i just insert that as a female and as a female psychologist. And two, what in terms of that empowerment for boys, we have a large cross section of boys in Toronto to be able that are hurting and there aren't outlets for assistance for them. So that question by the member of the public is critical. We have a large cross section of boys that have been sexually abused and unresolved in our communities right now. And what the Victim and Witness Support Unit has started last day and continues up to tomorrow, even self, would be, we've done a program for young boys in a cross section. We're looking at East Port of Spain right now, which is a highly traumatized community. They grew up um, seeing dead bodies every other week, walking through their relatives' blood. It's a common thing for those boys. So, what we're doing is having a developmental program for these boys so as to reschool them about values and about how to manage hurt and conflict and women and gender relations so that's one of the initiatives that we have ongoing it's actually titled who's writing your story so that the young boys can reclaim the pen and write their own stories and that is just one of the initiatives that we do and in for in instances where victims may come forward for help we too similar to dr spence and I'm happy that she deals with the PERP as well. We would refer the PERP for assistance, be it through one of the public agencies, because um, men play a key role in the conversation and the addressing of the issue of violence against women. And, and excluding them will be a huge oversight that will be perpetuated. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And I thank you for saying that men are not the enemy. We don't want to, for it to be skewed in any way. However, I must say, this is a question, by the way. You have all been so informative. When can we have another session? I dare say sessions with all of you. I believe that, that it's for Go ahead. Go ahead. That's from a viewer or is that from you, Ms. No, no, no. That's from a viewer. That was a question that was actually sent in. <laughs> yeah, so that um, I, I am sure that based on, on the, the interests that have been raised so far, the apostles will um, have to consider when next. But at this time, I want to um, put a pause on our answering of questions and we find a mechanism to probably get the answers that have not been offered yet out to those who would have asked because they're coming in from emails and so on and um, WhatsApp. Um, I will probably try to share them with each of the presenters if they have specific um, questions to them and we will get the answers to you. But of course, our time is far spent. Um, you know, we're going to do the vote of thanks, and then I'm going to invite Apostle Vivian, who's going to come down uh, to join Apostle Gemma, um, and he will have the last words, um, apostolic cover, and so on, before we end this session. So into our vote of thanks at this time. First Thessalonians 5.8, New Living Translation says, Be thankful in all circumstances, for this 
is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Psalm 92, 100, King James Version says, also reminds us, it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. On behalf of the Divine Destiny, around the Destiny Training Institute and the Leadership of Divine Destiny Worship Center, it's my distinct pleasure to have been given the honor to co-host this event and to say thank you after what can only be described as rich transformative revelation knowledge from our distinguished panel of speakers. Firstly, I'd like to say a heartfelt thank you to Prophet Simon Duncan for sowing the seeds of the idea of this event. Thank you, Prophet Simon, for your obedience. To Apostle Gemma for your insightful presentation on the role of the church in prevention and cure of domestic violence. We praise and thank God for your candor and usual direct approach to equipping the saints. Thank you. To Dr. Angel Duncan for your passionate delivery of the difficult topics of early red flags of abuse, the physical telltale signs of domestic violence and abuse, pornography and its impact on domestic violence, and the invaluable advice of preparing for a safe and productive existence as women and girls. Thank you also for your prayerful support and willing commitment to this event, all the way from the Body Church in Atlanta. Thank you. To Elder Dr. Joanne Spence for your deep and engaging contribution to the dialogue on the psychological impact of domestic violence and how to deal with sexual harassment in the workplace, as well as the clinical support needed for after a traumatic event. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to share some of your expert knowledge today. To Mrs. Aisha Corby for your frank but empathetic contribution on the actions needed to remove yourself from a threatening situation and environment. The timely advice on how family and friends should make critical interventions and be the game changers, as well as the professional treatment and support available to the victims of domestic violence and rape. And of course, those golden nuggets on how to deal with child abuse at home, church, the education system, and in the commute. We value your contributions and say a heartfelt thank you for what you do for victims and witnesses across Trinidad and Tobago on a daily basis. I declare your ministry to hurt the hurting public is about to make a way for you. Thank you. To Miss Alana Wheeler, we say thank you for your most insightful discourse on counter trafficking. For the survivors, uh, the helpful hints and tips regarding support for survivors of the scourge of what we term the modern day slavery. We truly appreciate your labor of love to the nation and to women and girls everywhere. Thank you. To our able men of royal destiny on the panel who competently brought a professional male perspective to this troubling issue with cogent solutions. Mr. Patrick McMillan, for your many years of service to our nation and the TTPS, as well as your intimate insights into personal protection an invaluable understanding of the awareness and mindset needed for safety and security in our beloved country, Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you, sir. You are credit to the service of the kingdom. Last but not least, to our final panelists with your commanding presence, Mr. Anthony Walcott, for your yes to partner with me in drafting and developing the vision which has been so well executed and received this evening for those most valuable practical tips on how to safeguard oneself in our current reality. The legal understanding on the use of non lethal weapons and the distinction and recommendations from your personal testimony as a law enforcement over, uh, officer for over 41 years. We look forward with eager anticipation for the follow on training and practical lessons on self defense and survival tips to Saturdays from now. Thank you, sir. To our young David's company representative of the next generation, Ms. Kyla Wilson, for a most creative and timely composition of the spoken word offering. Is today the day? I declare you are on your way to the top and you cannot be stopped. To Minister Marissa Humphrey for your willingness and at short notice to render a most appropriate choice of worship song for a musical interlude. You blessed our hearts. 
to Apostle Vivian, who trusted us and gave his blessing for this event, for your support, advice, and counsel. Thank you, Daddy. To my capable, competent, and charismatic co-host, Elder Francine Burton, for your support, advice, and excellence in execution. Thank you. To the administrator and staff of the Divine Destiny Worship Center for your tireless efforts in ensuring this evening's events were executed with excellence. Brother James Foster, Technical IT Director, and Gabriella White for her assistance with the questions. Brother Martin Seely and the audio and video teams who assisted in making this event a success. Elder Suzanne Coward, who exercised utmost patience in putting together our slides on the presenters. My family, Gabriella Jabari and Elizabeth, for your continued support and never-ending love. To Almighty God, for the blessing of life and the joy of his eternal strength and Holy Spirit for making this event possible. Praise God. I'd now like to take the opportunity to invite Apostle Vivian to have the closing remarks and prayer on the next steps, Apostle Vivian. Unmute. Okay, right, we give God praise and thanks for the initiative taken by the team to set this, well, I, I, I would say, set this program in place. Uh, it's not just an event, but I hope you are seeing it as the beginning of a series because uh, um, upstairs they're listening to the various uh, presenters and looking at the, the various comments coming in. And we know without a shadow of a doubt, uh, people have been touched and impacted by the various um, topics that were raised, the various um, presentations and certainly the questions and so on. So we are looking forward to see what will happen next. We cannot be overly um, careful uh, to, well, right. We cannot be overly careful not to address situations like these. But definitely, from the, the church point of view, me being a, a minister of the gospel, we know without a shadow of a doubt that there is healing available. The power of forgiveness is the key. The power of forgiveness. If we don't learn how to forgive, we can come up with all the scientific uh, scientific uh, theories and even practices. But without forgiveness, the healing will not take place. Over the years, the scientific world has rejected lots of what God has recommended and more than recommended what God has placed as the principle for healing. Now in universities where they had rejected forgiveness as being Judeo-Christian, having no place in science, now these very professors are spending millions of dollars doing what? They are researching the power of forgiveness. I'm saying to each of us on the panel, each of us who had been uh, viewing the bottom line for your healing is continued forgiveness. Teach yourself how to forgive. Teach your children how to forgive. 
teach those around you how to forgive because that's the one way to diffuse the pressure, neutralize the acid that comes with the pain. And certainly, the forgiveness that reaches to the point where we ask God for forgiveness. There is still a place for God in all of this because it is He who made us. And I dare say to you, when we come to the point of forgiving, there is a passage of scripture I would want all of us to read from Romans chapter 7, verse 15 right to the end of Romans chapter 8. I start from the beginning. Romans 7 verse 15 says, When I want to do good, evil is present. The thing I want to do, I cannot do it. But what I don't want to do is what I find myself doing. And many perpetrators of abuse they will tell you something drives them, something on the inside. They really want to stop, but something on the inside. And we know without a shadow of a doubt, that is a spirit. Abuse is not just a mental, physical thing. It's a spirit. But we have found this. By the time the, the writer gets to the end of chapter 8, he says this. Nothing shall separate me from the God that has brought me out of this pain that I was in. He said, who can separate me? Tribulations, trials, all of that? No. He said, I'm now living in a place, in a mental state, spiritual state, where all I want to do is to stay connected to God. So we give God Praise that this forum started. It started, which means the onus is on the organizers to plan the series, set your dates so that more people can come on and receive their healing. So I just want to give God thanks to all the panelists. Some names I have heard in the public domain, never saw the faces. Now we could put a face to the name. And we give God full access to everyone that sat on this um, platform today. And we pray God's protection over you in the name of Jesus. So Father, we just give you praise today. We thank you that you birthed this in the heart of the team. And we thank you that we were able to facilitate this tonight. We decree there are many who are leaving this session healed many will be in the state of being healed and lots lord who had the experiences that were spoken about will now be seeking healing we give you praise again those who work in the public domain we pray lord cover for them especially those who are in the police uh, service Cover them as they investigate these deep things in the name of Jesus. Lord, Brother Danley and the others who put it together, let your blessing be upon them too. In the name of Jesus. So, God bless you. We're looking forward to see the next session come to fruition. Amen. All right, good night. Somebody said all good things must come to an end. Did they lie? It is actually 
the word of God doesn't come to an end. Doesn't change. Doesn't come to an end. So thank you for joining us tonight. God bless you all. Have a good evening. Have a good rest. We'll see you next time. God bless you.